Now it's not on. Hello? Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not going to get the hang of this. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the talk about hacking mainframes. If you think it's about hacking other stuff, then you're probably in the wrong place. So this is my story about the time I was on a pen test and presented with a bunch of mainframes and applications and told I must go after them. And then I realized that there is a complete dearth of information um, about this stuff. And in the end, I was able to find like a pretty critical family of vulnerabilities in TN3270, uh, which led to some other interesting observations. But let me get into it. So my name is Dominic. I work for a company in South Africa called SensePost. It was a 28-hour flight to get here. But it was totally worth it. This conference is awesome. You guys are all fantastic. Yeah. And um, everybody's just been super inviting and welcoming. So, so thanks for making it such an awesome conference. Uh, if you want to talk about this afterwards, you'll be one of like two other people on the planet who do. Um, that's my contact details. All right, so first up, why was I looking at mainframes? So I told you the reason I was on a pen test looking at it. But this talk is about why you should look at them, not just because you're in a bind. Um, and I think we've got this perception that like hacking mainframes is like hacking the Gibson. Like we all watched hackers and it looked really easy. Like you just fly around and then you find the garbage file and you're done. Um, and like I would have thought that this technology has been around long enough that our community has built cool stuff for it and it would just be easy. But it turns out it's not. It's a dark, scary world of nothing. So, like, I think this is most people's view of mainframes. It's this legacy old dinosaur that's just about to die, and I don't mean that guy's about to die. I hope he's still alive. <laughs> but we, we don't test them. So, like, if, who, who here are pen testers? Who here have, um, who in this room has actively pen tested mainframe applications before? All right, so we've got two. Um, so that's, excuse my language, a fuck up. Like, what, what are you guys doing? What are we doing? Why, why are we not going after this? These things have critical applications, critical data. They've, like, underpin critical business processes. Um, and we're going after domain controllers. That's, that's cool, but, like, why aren't we going after this critical stuff, too? Well, that's one of the ideas that they fall over. To, uh, they don't, but I'll get to that. So a guy named Harun Mir, uh, one of the founders of SensePost, a man I have immense respect for, he did a talk called Pen Testing Considered Harmful. And what he said about pen testing is too often pen testers resemble other pen testers instead of us resembling actual attackers. So if we're knocking over domains and running our PowerShell scripts, that's cool. That's what the other pen testers are doing. But Logica, their mainframe got hacked with undisclosed ODA, massive financial damage, and I doubt anyone had ever pen tested it. Maybe there's a few auditors that poked at their RACF settings, but hadn't pen tested it. So I think like as a challenge to you guys, whether you're a defender or a, an attacker, like, get your mainframe apps pen tested. Otherwise, we're just ignoring critical stuff. Um, oh, so the other important thing is I'm talking about IBM System Z systems, so not System I like AS400s. Uh, system Z are the big, really expensive ones. And it's a modern, updated operating system. So the last major release for it was in April this year. Uh, they release hundreds of updates a week called APARs. Like, this is a modern operating system. It's not some piece of crap that hasn't been updated in years. Some of the original code was written like 30 to 50 years ago, but that gets updated. But so we don't touch them. Why don't we touch them? I don't, didn't touch them before, so I'd be sitting in this room getting shouted at too. Uh, and we don't touch them because we think they're going to fall over. You called that out. Like, I absolutely had that idea. When I started on this thing, I would just like slowly poke things. By the end of it, uh, quite literally at one situation, I had something with a thousand threads just hammering it. Because mainframes are actually really good at handling massive high volume transactions. So the, they fall over thing. AS400s a while ago had a problem with their TCP stack where like you port scan them, too many connections get opened, that state table dies, and then they fall over. And we still run into those. I'm sure like anyone who is in a pen testing company or even a company that runs these has got like an unspoken rule, thou shalt not port scan the mainframe. Um, but that stuff's not true anymore. You can port scan to your heart's content. It'll, it'll work awesomely. The other reason we don't touch it is we think that they're dead, but they've been around for like 30 years in some organizations, and there's no immediate plans to remove them. So I think like if they've lasted that many decades, maybe we should get around to looking at them some point in your annual audit plan. Um, then the other stuff is that it's really hard. So most mainframers 
excuse me if there are any in here, um, I'm sure you aren't, but the rest of you are assholes. Like, the forums are just, uh, they're ridiculous. So like I've got, I used to have a bunch of screenshots in here about people asking really innocent, polite questions, like wanting to get in the mainframe world. And the responses are like, who gave you authorization to do that? Go and get permission from someone who knows what they're doing. Read the manual. And the guy, like, and the one thing, the guy got desperate. He had a photograph of the manual. It's like stacks of pages like this, saying, I'm just asking for the page number. Um, <laughs> so it's like really difficult to figure this stuff out. Um, oh, and then the other thing is that, like, a lot of the people who built some of these stuff, in some cases, are dead. So in one case, the application where I found some pretty critical vulns and was still in major production use, like, the original author was dead. So they had to call IBM in to like rewrite the chunks of code to fix it. Because they're like, that's a weird problem to have. Okay, so the point that I want to um, get across in this talk is to sort of remove some of the fog of war around mainframes. Um, so this is kind of like more of a, a training thing. So I'm going to take you through some background and hopefully it'll help you when you look at these. So first off, what is a IBM System Z mainframe? So it's a big hulking piece of hardware that I think looks like that. I've never seen one. You don't have to see one to hack them. Um, the, the one on the right's from Wikipedia, the one on the left's from IBM's own documentation. Um, I don't know, has anyone in here seen a System Z mainframe? Can, can you put your hands down if it doesn't look like that? So, okay, one guy says it does look like that. All right, on a sample of one, we'll take it as it definitely looks like that. Um, actually, the closest I came to in physical hardware was I was trying to figure out how to print stuff to the screen. That's really where I was. Um, it wasn't working, I gave up. Two days later, some guy comes to me with a mail spool of stuff printed like this. I'd been running print commands, and they didn't know how to deliver it to me, because I was not like a real employee, and I wasn't in a real room. So eventually, it had all these sort of reroute instructions on them. He brings me this paper, like, is this for you? Bunch of hello world on bits of paper. Okay, so um, this hardware gets virtualized um, into what are called LPARs, which are logical partitions. There's something called um, ZVM, which lets you do that, and it's, it's a hypervisor, like VMware ESX. They just started doing it in 1972. Um, those LPARs can run various things, so ZOS would be the mainframe operating system that's most common, but it can also run AIX and Linux, things like that, but we're going to be looking at System Z. So then there's a bunch of concepts which it's useful to understand. So I'm not kidding, it took me two days to find out what VTAM was and that it existed, and that the thing I was talking to was that. Like, this, I'm putting it up here, it looks trivial, there's a bullet point with some information, but if you don't know what you're looking at, it's just like, where am I? What am I doing? And I think I see one guy who works on the mainframe laughing at me. Yeah. So, SNA is IBM's protocol that at one point they hoped would beat TCP IP. They lost that one. But it's still in implemented um, within mainframes, and it's how stuff talks, sort of, unless it's going over IP. So if you physically plug one mainframe into another, they'll talk SNA to each other sometimes. Microsoft's got SNA adapters for plugging into to mainframes, things like that. Then you've also got TN3270. So those physical green screen terminals that people used to have wired into mainframes, those did 3270 emulation. Because IBM lost to TCUIP, this stuff now gets wrapped in Telnet, so it's Telnet 3270 emulation. Um, and that's where the VOLNs exist. VTAM is a subsystem which implements SNA and actually turns out to be like the Rosetta Stone to accessing a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, then you've got things like LUs and PUs. So when you Telnet or TN3270 into a mainframe, you'll get connected to an LU, which is a logical unit. If somebody physically wires a printer to a mainframe, it's a PU, I think. Okay, but I'm talking about the application world, so let's jump into that. So the first most obvious application point would be TSO. It stands for Time Sharing Option. I think it's the only acronym I actually remember because the rest are completely and wholly unrelated to what they actually do. So TSO is the command line for the mainframe. Uh, if you want to get root on a mainframe, usually that user's called IBM user, but it doesn't have to be. You, you do that through TSO. If you really want to get root, you want to get access to the master console, but that's a separate discussion. Um, and this is like a bit like Linux. It's got traditional process accounting. So you log in, you get your own process space, you run things, it runs as that user. And that's quite different from the transaction managers, which do really high volume stuff by having shared transaction spaces. It's got a bunch of things you can do in here. So there's something that used to be called Unix System Services, which is a sensible name, but then it was called Open MVS. And I've actually got it in the slide. I can't remember what MVS stands for, but it's just something which has nothing to do with Unix. 
Um, but if you run OMVS within TSO, you'll get dropped into a shell. You can type LS, you can run GCC, WebSphere runs in there. It's an actively maintained used part of, of the mainframe. And actually, if there's FTP running on it, you have to have USS. Um, the thing to remember is that those are two wholly different worlds. So files that you see in the Unix world are not the same as the data sets you see in the TSO world. And so one, um, FTP is really good for navigating between those. Anyway, then there's something called ISPF, which is like a menu system for interacting with, with TSO. Then we get to the transaction managers, which is where I spend most of my time. So the two most popular ones are Kix and IMS. Both are IBM products. Kix is slightly more, it's got some modern binding, so you can have web services talking to transactions through Kix. I think you can put Java stuff in Kix as well. But so your COBOL and Fortran programs will run under Kix and IMS. IMS is more MQ style stuff, so if you're in like a financial services company and there's an MQ talking to transactions, they could be running in, in IMS. Um, and these are the things that just allow the efficient high volume processing. So they can do hundreds of thousands of transactions a second without taking too much sweat. This is like the real benefit why people went with mainframes. Now there's a ton of other stuff. So there's databases and there's MQ and there's FTP and there might be WebSphere on there. I'm ignoring all of that stuff because I'm talking about applications. A guy named Phil Young, soldier of Fortran, mainframed, he's spoken here before. He's done fantastic work on those aspects and check out his stuff, but I'm limiting to applications. Then you also get these authentication subsystems, RACF's IBM's and ACF2 is CA's. Um, I don't understand how you have like a pluggable authentication system that comes after the operating system. Like, like imagine Linux with PAM as like an optional extra you can add on later. Like it's, I don't know how it works, but magic. But let's get on to some hacking. Okay, so what's the first thing you do if you're plugged into a network and there's a mainframe on it? Port scan, yes. So you'll port scan this and you'll get a bunch of weird output and it's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. So the first thing you want to look for is these, what Nmap calls OS390 things. So OS390 is what ZOS used to be called years ago. I don't know why Nmap hasn't updated it. Phil submitted a patch, but they haven't fixed it. So when you see that, don't get confused and think that they're running a 40-year-old version of, of mainframe software. Um, they might be running 40-year-old apps, but we'll leave that aside. So there'll be a bunch of different ports running TN3270 that are interesting. So 1023, I think, typically connects you to TSO, like directly to TSO. 23 might take you to VTAM, and I'll get into exactly how that works. But they could be on all sorts of ports. It's kind of up to the mainframe admin how they configured it. Um, so generally, just do like a scan for 65,000 ports. Make sure they've updated in the last five years and um, probably won't fall over. Uh, so there's a couple of ports on there. I'll release the slides. You can look at those. FTP is awesome for hacking because it's something you understand interfacing with something you don't understand if you're new to mainframes. And what's particularly nice is it gives you access to both worlds. So you can type in ls forward slash star, and you can see all the stuff in the Unix directory, or you can type in ls star dot racf star, and that'll find like the racf um, password database. So in mainframe world, you've got data sets and they have high level qualifiers. So there's no such thing as directories and paths. So if my username was Bob, it would be like bob.directory1.file1. It's not, you don't get directories, but those would be data sets. Um, so you can look through the data sets and it does proper globbing. TSO doesn't do proper globbing. So if you like looking for files and you put a star in the front, it gets denied. Then the, once again, there's a bunch of other stuff, MQ. Um, if there's like known vulns for them, go for it. But I'm talking about apps. Uh, and something to bear in mind is it seems, at least in the few organizations I've looked at, that their mainframes have a ton of IPs. I don't know. So like the first time I port scanned and I did some footprinting, I was like, aha, I found millions of mainframes. It's like, no, it's just, just the one. So there's not much you can do without creds. They've actually got that pretty locked down. Now, if you're going to be doing application assessments, then just ask for creds like it makes sense. If you're going to do a proper scientific web app review and you're going to check like admin levels and lower user levels, you'll get creds. So like don't be scared of asking for creds to do proper app reviews. But if it's a black box, you need to get some creds. So the first thing that might help you is that historically mainframes could only have usernames and passwords that were eight characters long with no special characters. Uh, that's not true anymore, but some people haven't realized that truth yet. Um, and it, like usernames in particular often run into that. So if you've ever gone to an organization and like all of their active directory usernames are A12345, you know, it's probably because they started with a mainframe and then shifted over to active directory. 
Now there's a flaw in TSO that will allow you to enumerate usernames. So standard web app stuff, you put in one user, it doesn't exist, you get one response. Put in a user that does exist, you get another one. Uh, Phil Young's built a tool called Sciotic, which will enumerate that very quickly, and it can also do password-based brute forcing. Personally, if you're gonna do password brute forcing, I much prefer using FTP, because now you can use Hydro, Medusa, whatever your favorite bruting tool is. Um, so enumerate your usernames through TSO. Once you've got a nice list of usernames, do a horizontal brute, so try password against every user um, and hope you don't hit lockout. Oh, and then applications, so much like applications on web apps, um, you could have auth using the underlying RACF or auth could be doing its own thing. So if you've got a web app running on a box, it doesn't mean you'll log into it using the underlying AD creds um, or Windows creds, it could have its own auth stuff. So just be smart about the application. Okay, fingerprinting. So this stuff gets messy really quickly because VTAM can like connect you into different things and there's different transactions running in different um, application regions across different mainframes. So sometimes you'll connect to one mainframe, you'll run an application ID and you get connected to another mainframe. And like, unless you're really paying attention to what's being output on the screen, you don't know where you are. Sometimes it doesn't matter, truthfully. So to help you with that, um, so Phil Young wrote a tool called um, 3270 screen grab for Nmap. So that's really good for looking at what's on a port. Um, but I wanted to look a little deeper sometimes. So if like, if you're gonna brute force a bunch of transaction IDs to see what they do, then screenshot is quite useful. So there's a Python object called Py3270. I've made a wrapper for it so it behaves sensibly. And it's really nice. You can type in mainframe commands in the code. And so whatever bizarre access path you would need to follow to get to that part of the application, you can put it in there. So screenshotter is really straightforward. Wow, one-handed typing is harder than I thought. So the target I'm gonna give it is that, I hope, port 23, and I run it and it takes a screenshot. Woohoo! There's the screenshot. Okay, I ran it before, so there's two screenshots. So there's the, the mainframe I'm running. So if there's like 14 ports with, um, TN3270 on it, you can quickly screenshot those. If you find 20 mainframe IPs with a collection of 14 ports, then you can quite quickly put those together. And somebody at the back of the room showed me a cool tool they've written which will group these things together. So I want to steal his code and, um, and implement it here. Anyway, this stuff's on GitHub at the moment. I'll show you the link later. But don't stop at ports. Like, there's so much more. Ports do not give you the, the half of it. So VTAM is this multiplexer that'll allow you to connect to different things. And it does that through application IDs or Apple IDs. So when you get to a mainframe and you um, get the main, for most mainframes, the first screen you're presented with when you log on is VTAM. Sometimes there's a menu telling you what to type in, sometimes there isn't, it's just a black screen. And um, the way you can check if you're in VTAM is if you type in IBM test and you get this like IBM echo ABC123 string back. Um, for the longest time I would just run around typing that to go, am I in VTAM? Where, where am I? What am I looking at? Um, but knowing what application IDs are there is really useful because then you know what you can connect to. So the first thing I did was write an Apple ID brute forcer. Um, it's probably a stupid ID, idea, um, but I didn't have any other ideas at the time and it actually worked quite well later on. So all it, uh, I'll show you the, the thing at the moment. I've collected tons of application IDs from looking at public mainframes. So it turns out tons of people leave their mainframes on the internet. Uh, so I grabbed all the application IDs from their, their menus, and I also looked through a ton of IBM documentation. So if you want to do that, one hand. So the help is rather expensive because it can brute force a ton of different things. Um, the code I've tried to make really reasonable, uh, readable and modifiable, so don't be scared of messing with it. So the things with exclamation marks in the front are what I call macros. I don't know what they're called. So it's like a shortcut. Normally you have to type in log on space Apple ID and then in brackets put the application ID. So OMVS, kicks IMS, that kind of stuff. The hashes are function keys. So depending on your emulator, that would be like F1 and F3 just to see if it does anything. Sure, good question. Okay, so if I run mainframe Bruta, giving it a target, uh, same one. 200, I think it's that one. Uh, I then need a, I want to brute force VTAM Apple IDs. I need to give it a list of Apple IDs. I'm just going to use the quick ones. 
Oh, I failed. What did I fail at? Ah, dash A. So it checks if it's in VTAM. It then tries a bunch of application IDs. It's got some smart logic to figure out some configuration options. And at the end of it, you just get an idea of what's available. So this is a test mainframe. Uh, there's really nothing there. Uh, you can add dash M, which is a movie mode that Pi3270 supports. So then you can actually see what the emulator is doing. Um, I know that's really difficult to see. I'll zoom in for, for later demos. But you can see it's just automating that stuff, pulling up different screens. Um, so if you want to go big with this stuff, um, Xogs dash P, if those of you familiar with Linux know about Xogs, if you're not, don't worry about it. But dash P will allow you to create different threads for each task that it does. Um, you can scale that up massively against um, the right, right parts of the mainframe. Okay, but then we've got to go spelunking, right? So now we've got a bunch of application regions that we know about that we can connect to, so let's fuck with them. So with IMS, the thing that it took me probably two days to figure out, and then it was just a revelation, is to drop into the IMS shell, you have to hit the PA24 function, um, which depending on your emulator will get mapped to different things. Once you do that, then you can type in IMS commands. IBM has those beautifully documented. The most useful ones are um, the slash display Tron and display PSV things. So in IMS, you'll invoke a transaction by typing it. So let's say there's an application called app. So I'd, I'd type app, and then it would present me with a log on screen or something. So if you display Tran app, it will show you a bunch of things called PSVs. No idea what that stands for. If you then look at the PSBs, it'll show you alternate transaction names associated to those. So I found an application where um, I could just invoke it through something else and I bypass the log on screen. So I never needed to log on. Um, it's like a really stupid thing, but if you just mess around and look for it, you'll find these kind of bugs. Um, but then normal kind of web app style hacking, fuzz the parameters, fuzz the flow, see what you can get. Another bug I found with an IMS app if I tried to log on as a user that didn't have permission, so I was the right username and password, but that user didn't have permission to that app, I'd get an error, like denied. But if I tried to log on as somebody who did have access, it would say denied because you don't have an, the right password. And then I tried to log on with my user. It was like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so there was just some weird application logic. Don't be scared of looking for bugs that are that lame. So in IMS, it depends a lot on what the transaction takes. So it's how they've coded it, what the parameter is going to be. With Kix, it's a little more defined. So Kix has got transactions and takes parameters, and it's a bit more web appy. So transactions like a path, and the parameters are parameters. Parameters are normally numbers, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so with Kix, brooting transaction codes is quite useful. Um, so that was something I did. I found a manual for a particular application. Um, I threw every transaction code into screenshotter and just had to take a screenshot to see what I had access to. Uh, and same thing, fuzz parameters, see what you get. So this is a little bit of an overview of how that stuff might look. So the ports, you'll see the little callouts, the gray callouts, could take you to different areas. So you could connect directly to VTAM, or you could connect to an application region, like Kix or IMS. You can have multiple application regions, so there's not just going to be one Kix. There could be lots of Kix. It could be prod and dev. And then within those, there'll be a bunch of different transactions. Um, so with one application I found, um, it was a, a shared mainframe that they shared a bunch, a bunch of customers, bunch of customers, bunch of customers. And you would type, you would log into the Kix region for your customer, and then you would execute the transaction to log into your interface. Well, it turns out that you could brute force the Kix regions and find a bunch of other customer regions and dev ones, and then you could brute force the parameters past a logon and find a bunch of other customer logon portals. Um, so stuff like that gives you a huge target beyond ports. Then you've got transactions and parameters. Okay, on to the, the bulk of this, TN3270. So this is where I found the vulns, and, and it was most useful to, to understand. So 3270, the emulation that ran on, I think, terminals that looked like this. I never saw when I went to images.google and typed in IBM 3270 emulation terminal. And that was what came up. So 3270 deals with fields. It's got a bunch of fields which have a binary bit mask in the front called the field marker, and that's what the protocol is. It sends a screen full of fields forward, and when you submit something, it sends a screen full of fields back. It's pretty straightforward. And when I dug into this, um, when I looked at the X3270 emulator, which is an open source um, terminal emulator for this, 
So most of you who deal with mainframes might deal with something like Rumba, which is the commercial version. X3270 is the open source one. I saw this in the binary bit mask. So a field marker can be marked as protected or hidden or non-selectable, things like that. Um, and so does the obvious vulnerability pop out to any of you? David? Exactly. It's sending a bit mask saying, please mark this field as protected. Please mark this field as hidden. So what that means is we just tell our emulator to ignore that. So let me give you a practical example. So this is a screen you might see. You open up your terminal, you log on, Hack Me Bank asks you for a username and password. So you obviously type your username and password in the fields with the underline, and you can't type anywhere else normally, and that's what you think is there on a the screen. When you look what's behind it, so this is a view that my tool burp gives you, so I call it kind of the hacker view. You'll see those little bullets, those are the field markers. What's interesting about them is they actually take up space on the screen. So like when I first wrote it, I would not output the field markers to the screen, and then everything looked wonky. You actually have to, they're a printable character. Um, you, you'll see something like P1 in the top left hand corner. That's a hidden field, and it's a protected field, so I can't modify it. Um, you can trust me that it is because I've invented this example, I'm telling you. There's null bytes, null bytes, field markers and spaces all get rendered as spaces. So if you aren't looking at what's behind it, you don't know what you're actually seeing. Field markers, and so the input fields, they just don't have the protection bit set. So they're not marked as input fields specifically, they're just not marked as protected fields. So that's like a typical screen. Oh, and then a password field is unprotected but hidden so that your output's not echoed to the screen. Okay, so as David correctly guessed, this is all managed by the client. And um, it's relevant for later, but from hypothesizing that TN3270 might be a protocol worth looking at to a full working implementation that allowed me to bypass stuff in actual applications took 45 minutes. And that's not to say that I'm good. That's just how shockingly bad this thing is. Um, like, how did a protocol exist for like 30 years and no one find this stuff? So we hack our emulator um, to modify protected fields and show hidden fields. Uh, there's patches that are released with Burp, so you can modify your emulator. There's a combined one, you apply the patch and you get it. Um, and it works awesomely. Like I just, there were vulns falling out of the sky at that point. There were vulns where the username was encoded in a hidden field and you change the username and hit enter and you're logged in as someone else. There were vulns where um, you could just like bypass login screens, but let me get to that. So here's an example of a real mainframe. Um, this is University of Nevada. They've got it on the internet. Awesome. Um, I did not touch it or do anything. I mainly did a screenshot of their front login screen. And this happens to be running the same thing um, that I found the, the vulns in that are disclosed to IBM. So it's Tivoli NetView Access Services. So if you look at the hacker view of that, no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So if we look at how that would be rendered in my hacked emulator, you can see a couple of things. First off, there's now these digits that appear in the top left-hand corner, EMSP00. Those were hidden before. There's a four fields on the bottom right, which suddenly become clear, like what, what happens if I put data in those? Um, the, use, the password field's hidden, so it just inverts the color so that you can see that it's a hidden field. And then I can type crap anywhere on the screen. Uh, typing sense post was here is not going to do things. But maybe it's interesting if I change the terminal number. Is that being paused somewhere? If I change the date and time, something happened. So I saw Jason grinning at me, and I suddenly thought there was someone behind me. OK, so let's look at a, a more practical example. Well, sorry, not more practical. This is a combination of vulns I found in apps, demoed in one. So we've logged on to Hack Me Back Bank and um, we've got a menu. So this is quite typical in the mainframe world. The little input fields on the left, you'd put like a V in to go into view mode, or you'd put an E in to go into edit mode, or something like that, depending on your permissions. Uh, so if we look at the kind of behind the scenes view, what could we do with P2? So it was P1 when we were logging on, now it says P2. If on the logon screen I change that to P2, can I bypass login? Um, that, that's an example of the VOM that IBM had. Uh, there's this field with my username in there. If I change it to another username, does it allow me to modify it? I mean, this is trivial sort of vulns, um, but this stuff worked. So there was an actual application where I could do that and escalate my privs. There's a hidden menu function. Um, so that input field is protected, so I shouldn't be able to put input there, plus the option's hidden. So it's natural for the developer to assume that I shouldn't be able to do anything there. So if I put a V in that input field that's not there, will I be able to go in there? 
and, and I found in some cases you can. And you'll notice that this stuff is eerily similar to the family of web app vulns that we know and love. Um, how, we often see developers using hidden fields and putting stuff in there. I think back in the day, people would rely on the fact that an input field was marked as was protected so that you couldn't modify it. And then you just use burp and you modify the data. And essentially, it's the same thing, right? The, a developer made an assumption about what could be done. We found a way to violate that. So in web apps, it's using a web app proxy. With this, it's using the burp tool. And, and, and you get ownage. Um, but what's, what's scary for me, and when I first had this slide up, there was a question mark. Like, is it a family of vulnerabilities? But I've now had time to play with it a bit more. I've seen IBM's response to some customers. And it, it is a family of vulnerabilities that affects like anything going over TN3270. How it'll affect it will be different. But I found it in Kix apps, in IMS apps, in Rex stuff, in whatever the hell IBM wrote NVAS in, because they won't tell me. Um, but it's not Kix or IMS. So, like, it's an actual family of vulnerabilities, which is pretty terrifying. Okay, so I wrote a tool to make this easier. It's called Burp. Um, at the time, I thought it was a very funny play on the idea that, like, Burp with a U, the web app proxy, has this kind of, you've got your browser, and then you've got a Java console, like your hacker view. So I, had, I implemented the same thing. The stuff is so similar to web app vulnerabilities. Why don't we implement the same thing? So Burp, my tool, um, it does, let me show you. Okay, so I'm going to run burp. What it does on the left, it's popped up an emulator. On the right, it's the burp tools there. If I go to one to interactive mode, then my key presses go through to the emulator. That's just so you don't have to switch windows the whole time. Alt tabbing with X follow mouse is a nightmare. Um, there's, like, if you hit control H, it'll show you help. If you hit control K, it'll give you a key, which is useful to remember. All right, so if I log into TSO at this point, um, so it gives you the hacker view on the right. Um, there's a slight bug with this mainframe. It tries to, it, it takes a while to display the screen on the left. Anyway, let me not go into that. So I'm going to log in as a user called Foo. So you'll see on the top it says user ID Foo not authorized to use TSO. That's our username enumeration bug that our mainframe exploits. And on the right you can see green fields are unprotected fields which are input. The red stuff is stuff that's hidden. So in a normal emulator you wouldn't see these, these things over here. Um, so if I change foo to bar, you see you get the same thing, or bat, it's not authorized. Now on the right, you'll see this stuff scrolls. So strange enough, the longest part of writing this tool was writing my own Python key handling library that doesn't try and take control of your screen. So things like end curses don't give you scrollback buffer, but hackers love scrollback buffers because you can see what you just did. Um, so I'm going to type in IBM user, which is the default root user, and now it says, like it auto-completes the field with a bunch of stuff. And I'm going to log in with the very secure password of sys1, the default. Um, and it takes me to some stuff there. So on the right, if I exit out of this and I go to um, view history, you'll see there's a bunch of what I call transactions. So with web apps, you've got a natural idea of transactions. You send a request, you get a response. With mainframes, I've had to kind of mangle something on top of it. So what I do is you've got the first line of of a screen um, from the before and after, and then the red field is the modified fields that were submitted. So it gives you, at this point, a quick view of which is the one you're interested in. So you can see at this point I entered in the username IBM user. It took me back to the same screen. Cool. So let's go look at um, transaction one. Give me a bit more details, uh, but I don't want to. So th there I'll view the request, so it'll repeat the screen. Um, if I hit R, it'll show me the response. Um, I can hit P to view the screen in unmarked up view. Um, e to show it as the emulator shows it. Uh, you can save it to a file, things like that. And hit X to go back. You can find transactions, things like that. Then there's a, a really nice um, bunch of Python objects that I've wrapped tons of um, mainframe concepts in. So you can do really quick Lambda searches across stuff and go down to a row level. Anyway, um, I think it's quite a useful tool. I used it in actual assessments, got lots of vulns, could write a report afterwards with screenshots despite not having access to a mainframe. It's kind of the things you need. So if we go back to our favorite um, mainframe at Nevada, um, this is the a normal view that the mainframe would see. And here's our hacker view. So it's the same stuff, the EMS P00 in the top left-hand corner. I've just got row numbers. I show nulls, stuff like that. Am I going backwards? 
Sorry. So these are some of the features. We'll leave that. Okay, but let's get into the, the O-Day. Well, it's not an O-Day anymore, but at the time it was. So this is my rendering of the O-Day, because I can't disclose the client and all sorts of things like that. Which, interestingly, um, so IBM started poking to try and find out who the client was, um, where I found this stuff initially, and all of the emails had to go through lawyers. Um, and it turns out that IBM has to approve who is allowed to audit their customers' mainframes. Yeah, it's weird. Okay, so on the left-hand side, um, that's the, the terminal screen, and on the right-hand side, you'll see the burp console view. So this is IBM Tivoli NVAS, and so you can see the view on the right. That EMS P00 in the top left-hand corner should be familiar to you now. Okay, so we're going to log in. I put in my username and password, and you can see over here, the password is shown because hack of you. Here it's not because it's a hidden field. And we log in. So the Voln is post-auth, it's not pre-auth. Um, now, this is a menu of things that you can access. So here, this user is unprivileged, but he's configured that he can access the IMS region, TSO 1 and 2, App 1 and 2, Kicks, etc. So I'm an unprivileged user, and there's a command called ADM that I can put in this command field at the bottom, which will take me to, let me show you, as an unprivileged user, just a a thing that will allow you to change the configuration of the applications that you've been given access to. So you can pass different creds through, you can um, edit some other options, like what number it's got. Now, as an unprivileged user, this is all I can do under the ADM command. But in reading the NVAS documentation, I found out that there's a bunch of other transaction codes, and you'll see this EMS PU1 in the top left-hand corner has changed. Um, so the first thing I did is I actually tried to brute force all of those. And then I read the documentation. So I'd highly recommend reading documentation first. I got the same answer. Um, one was just a lot more fun. Um, and so it turns out there's this transaction called EMSPA1. And if I change that to that transaction, what I noticed on the screen was if I tried to complete the fields here, I get weird errors. And it became clear to me that the screen, like the, the mainframe had a different view of what the screen should be than what was being displayed. So scratching my head, how do I get it to update? So I worked out if you go into help and then exit out of help, it'll redraw the screen to exactly what you want. So now I've got this two things. One, I've got a menu on the left with things like assign a user to a group. Plus there's a bunch of hidden menu functions which look super juicy. So I'm like, yes, I've got my shirt over my head. I'm running around the office. The client's looking at me funny. Um, so I go to the command, certain of my victory. I type three, I hit enter, and it's just like, no, you don't have access, idiot. Damn it. Um, so yeah, the menu, I can get access to it, but I can't do anything. So there's another menu, EMSPA1. Check that out, same problem, can't do anything. But it turns out that that's third option, and the transaction code for it is EMSPG2. So you see in the top left-hand corner, I put in EMSPG2. I go into help to redraw the screen, exit. And now I've got access to something called assign a user to a group. Now. I think, I haven't had it confirmed, that this actually writes RACF rules on the back end, but either way, I can now do things that I, I shouldn't be able to do as an unprivileged user. And what I'll do is I'll, so I put my username in there, I want to get access to the admins group, and I want to get access to the admin X application. These are all made up for the purposes of the demo, but I did exactly this against real NVAS um, and real applications. So I hit enter, and you can see it's updated it. User one made the change now. Awesome. So I exit to go back to my menu, and now I've got this AdminX application there. So I was able to escalate my privileges within IBM NVAS, um, and that was the, the bug I found and disclosed to them. Okay, where are the slides here? So IBM was super proactive about it. Um, I did this talk, the initial version of this talk, at Hack in the Box Amsterdam, and they saw the abstract guy named Peter Sperger from IBM security team contacted me in January and said, um, are you willing to work with us and share it? They asked really smart questions, and they supposedly fixed it. I say supposedly because they have refused to acknowledge it publicly. Like, they don't acknowledge any mainframe security vulnerabilities publicly. Um, they don't give you any credit as a researcher. Um, you're certainly not incentivized to, to do stuff for them. Um, and then, they, more importantly, they don't tell customers unless you kind of ask. So there's two ways you can ask. One, you can read the system security portal dutifully. But even then, you have to be a customer of that product. So if you've got NVAS installed 20 years ago, and it's working, and you maybe haven't updated your license, 
then you don't know patch view. Um, if you're a customer that's evaluating NVAS, you don't even get to see this stuff. So if you, if you run NVAS in your organization, go check the security APARs um, or open up a PMR with IBM. So um, two different customers currently have PMRs out with, with IBM to fix this and other stuff. Thank you. You're right, it is hard to see over there. Um, so that's cool. They patched it, the stuff's fixed, proactive, um, fast. Apart from the veiled legal threats, it was a pretty pleasant experience. And then actually, <laughs> when I did the first version of the talk, um, so Peter was in the, the room, I was like, oh, IBM's here, and his face just paled. <laughs> and he came up to me afterwards, he's like, how did you know I was here? I said, um, well, because I recognize you. He's like, but we just talked over email, how do you recognize me? I'm like, because you were trying to like, threaten me, dude, I did, I did my homework, like I know. <laughs> But he was just a super cool guy, like he was a hacker, just like a smart technical, um, I mean he was obviously guarded, he didn't share a bunch of stuff, but um, was actually really helpful. So they've got good people working there. But as for the wider issue, like this is a family of bugs, there were a bunch of other applications that are affected, and the response is, well get the developers to rewrite it. Cool, they're dead. N now what? Um, and I don't mean to be flippant about the fact they're dead, this was an actual incident in one particular application. Um, it's like a real problem that the mainframe world has to deal with. And so like our current understanding of how we should make sure an app is secure is currently with bug bounties. That's, that's what we've got, right? Do your SDLC, do your pen testing, but even then we're probably not gonna find everything. Let's just try and direct people's evil towards our desired outcome and give them a t-shirt or some money or something. So IBM's completely the other way with this stuff. So on the one hand it makes sense. If they disclose vulnerabilities in their stuff that people privately report to them, then we know about them and it ends up as a Metasploit module and people talk about it at cons like this, about how they popped five mainframes. So there's some, like, there's some sense to that, right? You don't want people to know about it, let's keep it secret. But on the flip side, uh, this protocol's been around for 30 years and it took me 45 minutes to find these vulns in it. Like, if, if, who here would be prepared to bet any one of you could spend 45 minutes on Windows looking at a 30-year-old protocol and be anywhere near as successful. Like, you wouldn't, because like, they've followed a fundamentally different path, or at least were forced into it in some cases. So, like, I'm, I'm a little worried about how IBM's doing their mainframe stuff, and particularly since it's in this world of obscurity and douchebaggery, where no one shares any information, everyone's super focused on one little part of it. Like, this stuff's not gonna get better until you make it better. Um, and I'm firmly of the belief that the way hackers make stuff better is you break it, you make yourself as helpful as possible to people to fix it, and then that stuff gets fixed. Um, so go out and hack some mainframes, man. Okay, if you want to get started in mainframe hacking and join Phil and I. So the first thing you can do is you can run your own mainframe. There's this emulator, it's incredible, it's called Hercules, now Hyperion, and you can run your own mainframe on, on your machine in an emulator, like that's rad. The problem is you have to pirate the mainframe. Uh, so being a, a good boy, I approached IBM, I was like, hey, I don't want to pirate a mainframe, can I have one? And they're like, sure, do you own any hardware? I own a Mac. <laughs> Denied. So you can get the application developer edition if you own a physical mainframe. So you know, let's just put that on your budget for next year, buy Proxmark, buy mainframe. Um, so piracy is bad, but right now it's like the only way you can get, for the average person you can get it. So we're currently in discussions with some people, there might be more legitimate ways to get stuff. Uh, we're hoping to do that. But like, if anyone from here is from IBM, like we wanna go legal, man, help us out. Uh, the other thing is DESI. It's an online mainframe. You won't get root on it, but you can at least play around. Um, it's kind of cool for some of the basic stuff. Soldier of Fortran's blog is incredible. Um, it just, if you don't know anything about mainframes, this is where you start. I think any of you who've had a mainframe pen test probably did start there. That's sort of certainly where I started. His stuff's rad. Uh, check it out. He helped lots um, initially when I was getting stuff. My initial code was based on his stuff. I can't give him enough credit. Uh, he's mainframe767 on Twitter. Then IBM's got an awesome master the mainframe course. If you do the whole thing from beginning to end, it'll take weeks but it's really nice, you can slowly get into things, plus at the end of it you get a t-shirt, right? Eh? Um, but it's a really nice introduction from everything to TSO right through to actually writing apps. I'm still working through it. If you wanna get the code um, for Burp, it's on our GitHub, github.com slash sensepo slash burp. Um, so thanks to a bunch of people, um, a named customer that let me 
mess with their mainframe in the beginning. Phil Young mainframed IBM for their awesome response on NVAS. And DerbyCon for a fantastic conference. If you want to get the code, it's there. Those are my contact details. Um, we've got five minutes. Are there any questions? So whatever your emulator is, sorry, let me repeat the question in case everyone didn't hear it. What about other emulators? So stuff like using Java for emulation. So whatever your emulator is, it's still talking the same protocol. So hypothetically, you should be able to, if it's open source, hack that emulator to do the same things. Um, but some of them aren't open source. Sometimes you'll hit a web app, which will load up Java, and that'll be your emulator there. So the trick is to try and get yourself in a position where you're running your own emulator. But like if it's pushing a Java applet down to you, it's Java, you can decompile it. I think it might be interesting to see if you could introduce the same things, if that's your only access path. Um, but it might be worthwhile pulling up TCP dump and see, is it making direct connections to the mainframe? Um, and see if you can then make direct connections. So I'd try to avoid using another emulator beyond my one. Yeah. So I've got a, I really want to look at an AS400, so their emulation is 5250. Um, I suspect it might be vulnerable to the same things. I haven't had a chance to, ex to go there. Um, if you're looking for something to do and you've got an AS400 system I, that's like a really, I, I suspect it's as ripe for vulnerabilities. No. Um, so much like, so if you're presented with that problem in a pen test, how do I find system X? Um, you've got to rely on your stuff. Go look at the, the internal um, intranet, see if you can find documentation on how to connect, hack somebody who connects to these things and check. Sorry, the question was how do you find them on the network? Are there common DNS names? Um, so for example, at one client, their mainframe, let's say hypothetically, was called Bob. You know, there's a bunch, I'll iterate through all the DNS looking for something with the word Bob in it. Um, so it's pretty standard, like footprinting techniques, but nothing specific to the mainframe. Yeah? Yeah, so... I Doing some super assy things, I did not once cause a piece of downtime or break an application in any irreparable way. I never even had to contact an admin to say, hey guys, I'm sorry, I broke it. Like the stuff was surprising or robust. And in the beginning, I was working on eggshells. By the end of it, there was one situation where I just had a couple of hundred threads pounding kicks trying to enumerate things. Like in the right areas, the stuff is really robust for what, for what it's good at, like running transactions in transaction managers. Just go for it. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. So um, what I would do is I'd find a list of transactions, as you said, either from documentation or if I could get them somewhere. Um, so if, funny enough, if you find an audit spreadsheet, people who are auditing transactions, those are generally good sources if it's a black box. Uh, and then I would, I would try and brute them as an unauthenticated user so that I couldn't access things which should do bad stuff. But yeah, anything which looked like um, halt and catch fire, I tried not to run. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point, thank you. All right. Okay, if you um, want to talk more about it, I'll be outside. Thank you so much for your time. Um.